Good afternoon and welcome to the TME Presents Remediation at Coast Guard Base Kodiak. You've read the article, now learn the rest of the story. I'm Daniel Wheatley, Associate Editor for the Military Engineer, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Before we get started though, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. All the attendees are in a listen-only mode for the presentation. You can submit questions for the presenters at any time by using the questions pane of your control panel. We will collect these and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please also submit any technical issues you may be encountering here as well. We will have a few polls throughout the presentation, so let's try one now to see who we have in the audience today. Just fill in what part of the AEC community are you part of? We'll give it a little bit more time to see, get a couple more votes coming in here. All right, looks like we got a lot of private industry, some public sector. We'll be closing it here in just about three, two, and one. So it looks like we've got almost half of the, the audience here with private industry, public sector, um, and a couple other nonprofits, academia, and uh, a little bit of a fully retired uh, group out there. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you all for being here and uh, thank you for participating in our poll. TME present, uh, covered this article, uh, covered this project, I should say, as part of our January-February 2020 issue. At a remote Coast Guard installation on Kodiak Island in Alaska, a previous dry cleaning facility had left the site in need of soil and groundwater remediation. Contaminants from solvents disp disposed of during its time of operation were found to be part of a plume that had migrated underneath nearby occupied structures creating a dangerous vapor intrusion issue. Previous cleanup attempts had only been partially successful. In 2015, the Coast Guard worked with Atna Environmental to address the contamination while also keeping the nearby structures intact. Due to these specific challenges, traditional remediation tactics, such as excavation and backfill, uh, would not work. So Atna proposed a three-phase approach of collecting baseline groundwater samples and borings to ob obtain geochemical parameters, removing old utilities and replacing them with modern components, and digging out the areas with the highest concentration of volatile chemicals, and replacing it with engineered backfill. I would like to now introduce our featured uh, presenter, uh, Rick Garrard, PE, the Senior Environmental Program Manager with Atma Global LLC. Uh, he's gonna give us a more in-depth look at the project and its takeaways. So Rick, the floor is yours, so take it away. All right, thank you, Daniel. Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. Um, let's see, can you see my screen yet? Try it again there, Rick. So is my screen showing? Sorry, there, there you go. Try, try that. <laughs> is it? Uh... Perfect, thanks, Rick. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's showing. All right, good. Um, yeah, so what I'm gonna talk about today um, is a uh, contaminated site at uh, Coast Guard Base Kodiak, which is on Kodiak Island, um, Alaska. Um, and so some of the things we're gonna 
kind of touch on is, um, you know, environment and health concerns caused by um, this former laundry facility. And then a method to excavate contaminated material from below the groundwater table right next to a building. And then uh, discuss a little bit about uh, chemical and biological degradation of chlorinated solvents. And then a little bit about the logistics of uh, trying to uh, dispose of uh, ripper hazardous waste from a remote site. And so, like I said, uh, the base is on Kodiak Island, which is in the Gulf of Alaska, southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And then the base itself is right near the airport. Um, and uh, a, a big part of the, the base surrounds uh, Woman's Bay. And so it's called Site 3, former laundry. Uh, the base was constructed back in World War II um, as a naval base and the laundry facility was one of the uh, original buildings constructed back then. Um, and so it operated as a laundry um, since then. Uh, and in 1972, the Navy turned the base over to the Coast Guard and uh, the Coast Guard continuing, continued operating that building as a laundry until 1999 when it, became a MWR facility. Um, and that's what it's still used as today. And everybody refers to it as Cloud House. And this is just a, a picture kind of showing you the base, the laundry facility is right there. Um, kind of north there are uh, barracks buildings in, in the galley. And this photo was from 1951. And so there's a picture of what the laundry building, uh, the boathouse looks like today. Um, as I said, it's an MWR facility. Uh, probably the biggest thing they do is maintain these boats that they ran out for people to take out for their fishing. Um, I think they also deal with some ATVs and ATV trailers too. So uh, when it was operating as a laundry, uh, Apparently their disposal practice for the uh, spent still bottoms from, from dry cleaning operations, uh, they would just toss them out the back door onto the ground south of the building. It, uh, my guess is they thought they're volatile uh, compounds and they could just evaporate off and be gone. But uh, that really wasn't the case, uh, a fair amount of it. Uh, soaked into the ground. Um, that practice was discontinued in 1987. And uh, the solvent that they were using was, uh, was tetrafluoroethylene, also called PCE. So in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, it, it, they did some uh, environmental investigations under RICRA. Uh, base wide. And that's when this site, site three, was identified. And then uh, in the source area at the time, uh, they just were looking at this area to the south of the building. And uh, they decided to remediate that source area to install an air sparge soil vapor extraction system. Um, it wasn't until 2005 that uh, an additional source area on the east side of the boathouse was discovered. Um, and it's presumed that that, uh, that source area was from leaks in a sewer line. And, and it, you know, we presume they were disposing of solvents down the, the sewer drain too. Um, this picture shows the air sparge vapor extraction system. Uh, the air sparge piping, which is uh, in a sense pressurized air uh, into sparge points below the groundwater table, that's what you see above ground. And then the vapor extractions underneath the asphalt cap. And in the background there is uh, the building that houses the blowers um, and uh, activated carbon filters. 
So that air sparse vapor extraction system was only addressing that southern source area, and it, and it was really not having any impact on that eastern source area. So in 2006, um, tried an interim corrective action using um, in situ chemical oxidation with uh, potassium permanganate. And uh, when you mix this, it's a, it comes in a powder, and then you mix it with water, then you inject it uh, underground, you know, into the, the area you're trying to treat. Um, when you make this solution, it's, it's purple. It looks like Kool-Aid. Um, and so about the second day of injections, um, started seeing uh, this purple solution in uh, Inner Woman's Bay, right where the, the stormwater system outfall. Uh, and then kind of looking at things, we stopped uh, the injections and uh, determined that there was a storm drain running alongside the boathouse. Um, original to when the base was built, uh, constructed out of wood state piping um, and groundwater was getting into this storm line. And, uh, and you know, from there flowing out into uh, the bay. Um, so the injections were stopped. Uh, and then between like 2007, 2012, there was a number of other side investigations. Um, and so this is an aerial photo. The boathouse is kind of right here. Uh, that purple dash line is roughly the groundwater plume uh, that exceeds, exceeds groundwater cleanup lines. And then the, the blue line is, is roughly the whole plume where you can detect uh, site contaminants in the groundwater. But as you'll notice, uh, these plumes, uh, the boathouse sits over top of it, and the galley sits over top of it, and part of barracks uh, one. Um, you know, so these are all structures with people in them. And uh, the contaminants, uh, PCE, and it's, it's breakdown products and volatile organic uh, compounds. So the groundwater carries these uh, contaminants beneath these buildings. Uh, which then volatilize out of the groundwater up through the soil uh, and get into these buildings. Um, and all of them currently have active vapor mitigation systems to, to keep these uh, contaminants from entering the occupied spaces. And then as I, as I said before, uh, contaminated groundwater was entering the storm sewer system along the east side of the boathouse. And then uh, it would join the, the main system which carried it to the west and over into the bay uh, by the boat dock uh, that you can see to the left. Um, so the, the, the real driver for needing to remediate the site is you can both have an environmental impacts with, with contaminated groundwater getting into the bay and then uh, vapors getting into occupied structure. So then in 2016, um, they conducted a pilot treatment study to, to look at a, a different way of addressing um, the remediation of, the, of these source areas. And the, the pilot treatment study focused on that eastern. Um, there were three phases to that. The first one was doing some additional soil sampling to collect some further data on uh, soil at the site. And then the, the second phase uh, was to get rid of that um, storm line that, that ran alongside the uh, east side of the boathouse and to basically reconfigure their um, storm sewer system so that in the vicinity of the boathouse, the uh, Stormwater flow stayed on the surface. It didn't go subsurface until it was north of the boathouse. And then the main the main part of this was phase three, which was excavating uh, the hot spot and uh, backfilling with the venom. Um, 
So this is just a photo of, of doing some of the soil borings and um, the phase one. This one is phase two. Uh, this is right along the boathouse. Like, like I said, these, these this pipe was installed in the 1940s, and, and back then, they, it, their storm sewer system was wood stave piping, which is literally wood boards uh, wrapped with uh, the, the steel band. Um, so it, they, they weren't super watertight. And on the southern end of this system, the, the piping was actually below the groundwater table. And that's where um, GMA of water was entering the system. So we, we basically dug up all that pipe. So then on the, the phase three, um, because the, the, the source area, the most contaminated soil was actually below the groundwater table because uh, PCE is heavier than water. So uh, unlike petroleum, it tends to want to go down, not float on top of it. Um, we're very close to a building. Uh, I know it didn't look like much in that, in that photo, but it's, it's a historic structure. Um, we didn't want to disturb the building. The other uh, issue with excavating, um, or like with a, a regular excavator, and you know maybe driving, making a coffer dam or something, uh, which you would you would end up having to pump out a lot of contaminated groundwater. And because this contamination plume is is spent solvents, it's it's an F listed river waste. But what it really means is, is anything you you pull out of the ground is is a hazardous waste and it has quite a few regulations around it. Um, so we really wanted to minimize how much uh, groundwater we would generate um, to, to reduce disposal costs. And then we also wanted to put something back in there that would help uh, degrade the remaining contaminants. Um, so we had chose this product, Duramed, to mix uh, with a sand pack fill. This is kind of a, a plan view of the, the soil contamination at the site. You can see the boathouse. And then this red area is uh, the hot spot that we were targeting. This is a cross section of, again, uh, contaminated soil and uh, you know the hot spot zone that we were targeting. One thing I'd like to point out in this is the site has a pretty dramatic change in, in groundwater elevation um, as you move north. Um, right around the south end of the building, groundwater is only about five feet below the surface, and that's where this hot spot was. As you go north, that, that groundwater drops another five, 10 feet. And then this is just a close up of, of what we were targeting. Um, Again, you, you can see the, the groundwater table is well above uh, the hottest soil. And then the other thing to point out here is about 25 feet, give or take, uh, is bedrock. So another aerial with that red square um, showing where we were going to do the excavation. We also get a good picture to the south of the building of the air sparge vapor extraction system, which you know you can see its footprint. Pretty obvious it wasn't going to do anything for that eastern source area. So uh, like I said, to avoid generating a lot of groundwater, to avoid minimize disturbance to the, the buildings. Um, foundation of uh, what we did was drive in three foot casing using a vibratory hammer um, hung from a crane. Um, and the idea was to drive these all the way down so we hit the bedrock and then uh, try and key it into the bedrock um, so that when we excavated from 
within that casing would minimize how much groundwater came up into the casing. And then in, in this photo, you can see where we got pretty close to the building. We weren't entirely sure how big the footer on this building was. We assumed three feet, so we stayed three feet out from the wall. But uh, it, um, it actually worked pretty well that, you know, there was some concern about shaking, excessive shaking, vibration on the building, but this uh, this thing actually, you could barely feel anything when it was uh, hammering. It, it, it was more of a higher frequency vibration and it, and it just, that casing just went down really smoothly until it hit the bedrock. And then in this case, they had just painted some lines so we get some idea how far into the bedrock we were able to get it. In most cases, after about a foot or so, um, that was about it. But it seemed to be pretty effective. So then once we had the casings driven, uh, again, because everything was in a hazardous ways, we, we put plastic around, attached it right to the rim of these casings so that, you know, any soil that sloughed off uh, landed on that plastic, which also um, got disposed of. Um, so essentially, we drove that uh, auger down the inside of, of these casings, uh, pulled it up, removed the contaminated material, um, went into a loader bucket, and then you can see in the background a, uh, a sludge container that we had shipped up to Kodiak. Um, these had rubber seals on them so that any uh, water that, that uh, came out of the soil, because most of it was going to be fully saturated, um, that you wouldn't have a leakage out of these containers while they were being transported uh, to the disposal facility. But um, yeah, and that, like I said, these contaminants are uh, volatile. So, you know, we were working in respirators and did air monitoring and all that. So once uh, we had excavated all the way down to the bottom of the uh, casing, um, and we're pretty fortunate in that, that it, what we were hoping would work did, and that with the casing keyed into that bedrock, uh, we did not get much groundwater infiltration. Um, so that was a good thing. And then uh, in order to backfill, um, we would have a, a concrete truck with sand. And then in this uh, bag is the uh, soil amendment. Um, and so we, we lifted over the concrete truck, dumped the amendment into the, uh, to the drum, and then, you know, he'd mix it together. And then, uh, slide, slide some other things. There we go. And yet a good thorough mixture, and then we just discharge it out of the concrete truck into the casing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we latch onto the casing with the vibratory hammer again, and then just vibrate it back out of the, the ground. And uh, being sand, it, it settled pretty well um, just from the vibrations. Um, so that all ended up going pretty good. This is a picture of the sand with the amendment in it. You can't really see it too well, but um, it was pretty thoroughly mixed. Like I said earlier, we used uh, this product um, from Proxy Chem called Duramed. Um, and it's uh, a combination of zero valent iron, ZVI, and then uh, a carbon source, and then um, some nutrients added in. Um, the stuff kind of looks like sawdust, it's non toxic. Um, and it, it is designed to uh, both promote a uh, chemical reduction of the contaminants uh, from the ZVI, and then also to promote biological biodegradation with, with the carbon source and, and the nutrients. And then this picture is just um, 
when we got done, it was uh, late October and the asphalt plant on the island had shut down. So we ended up patching the area with concrete, which actually makes it real easy to see where we had done the work. But the other thing I wanted to point out in this photograph is now we have, uh, you know, the surface drainage um, for stormwater. Because uh, right beneath this concrete uh, gutter um, was the old uh, buried uh, storm storm line. So now, because you know, the whole area is paved, uh, stormwater is very minimal infiltration into the ground. Um, most of it runs off by surface flow, uh, and then enters the storm sewer system farther down. Um, so not all of the, the borings, the casings got filled with the amendment. Uh, we had some concerns about the, the foot or the foundation on the boathouse. So this is just kind of showing the outline of, of the, the you know, various spots we, we drove the casing. But the two rows closest to the boathouse Instead of getting the Duramat amendments, um, we did a uh, controlled density fill. This essentially added cement to the sand uh, to make a, you know kind of a very weak uh, concrete mixture. Um, the intent was to avoid settling. And then, like I said, uh, Kodiak. It's not as remote as a lot, a lot of parts of Alaska, but it still has some logistical challenges. Um, all of the soil we removed was a rick or hazardous waste. Uh, there's nowhere in the state of Alaska to treat or dispose of uh, that type of waste. Um, so it was all destined for chemical waste management down in Oregon. Um, so I had to bring these containers in uh, via barge, truck them over to the site. Um, then after they all got filled, um, they got manifested and, and then uh, you know, back on a barge to head back down south. Um, unfortunately, uh, the least expensive barge service for out of Kodiak going back south for this, uh, they, they kind of travel the inside passage down Southeast Alaska, and then they transit through Canadian waters. Um, so if you're transiting through Canadian waters with hazardous waste cargo, you have to get permission from the Canadians. Um, and for whatever reason, during this time period, they were very slow um, at giving, uh, giving those authorizations out. So we, we ended up having that barge company drop the containers off in Seward, Alaska, and then they got trucked up to Anchorage uh, and then put on an ocean going uh, vessel that stayed out of Canadian waters on its way down to Tacoma. So it's just, uh, it's kind of different hoops you jump through uh, dealing with things um, on Kodiak. And so, of course, after we, we put this amended soil in, we wanted to see uh, how it was doing. Um, so there was uh, several rounds of groundwater monitoring. Um, and so a, a, a real, real fast chemistry lesson. Um, it's not, I guess this might be a good spot for that second poll, Daniel. All right. Just checking in with everybody about uh, your familiarity with the remediation of chlorinated solvents. Um, I'll give about 30 seconds or so for the poll. For the poll. All right, we've got some good responses coming in here. Going to give about five more seconds, three, two, and one. 
there you go, Rick. Looks like we've got a little to no familiarity um, winning kind of the majority here. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll keep things simple then. Um, can you see my screen again? Yes, yeah. okay. I see yours now. <laughs> yeah. I, so, like I said, the, the, the solvent they were using in the laundry was uh, PCE, uh, which a PCE molecule has four chlorine atoms. Um, that will break down into trichloroethylene, which has three chlorine atoms, and, and then down to dichloroethylene, um, which there's two isomers, um, and, which has two chlorine atoms. And then that down to vinyl chloride uh, with one chlorine atom, which unfortunately vinyl chloride is one of the more toxic um, molecules out of this whole chain. And then what you're trying to do if you're if, if you're trying to degrade PCE all the way down to uh, a non-toxic um, compound is uh, ethene, which uh, all the chlorine atoms are gone replaced by hydrogen. Um, so, and the reason I bring this up is is because quite often you can go from PCE to TCE fairly easily and then even get hung up at DCE and it doesn't degrade further or worse, you'll get hung up uh, at vinyl chloride and uh, you'll have a, a tough time degrading that. Um, and, and at that point, you know, you almost have a worse problem than you started with. So when we were looking at uh, soil amendments, uh, we really wanted, uh, and we're looking at, you know, full degradation all the way down to FB. So, uh, you know, we, we monitored for a bunch of different uh, compounds and, and geochemical parameters. Uh, we did two baseline events before all the, the, the excavation started, and then a series of events uh, afterwards. Brown water sampling. And so, like I said, one of one of the things this uh, Duramed was supposed to do was promote biodegradation. So, so we did do some sampling for microbes, um, and so we were looking for a particular microbe, the halococodes, um, which can break down PCE and chlorinated solvents. But there's, there's different, different flavors of these things, and not all of them will break down the PCE all the way down to ethene. So we also uh, analyzed for a number of uh, enzymes uh, that are known to be associated with uh, complete uh, degradation of the um, and so this is just showing the, the groundwater monitoring array. Um, since this site's been studied for like 30 years, there's, there's quite a few uh, groundwater monitoring wells to choose from when you, you're looking at something. Um, and I know these look kind of rough, uh, but the, the one thing I want to point out on these graphs, and, and they're from four wells that we have been sampling, is the, uh, the dark blue line. Um, so that represents total chloroethanes. So if, if, you're, if you're truly degrading the, the, the contaminants all the way down to ethene, a non-toxic thing, you, you want to see that that blue line um, going down. Um, which it did. Um, so that, that kind of demonstrated that it was being effective. And in, in this graph, uh, the bars are showing uh, bacteria counts. Um, and then the lines are showing uh, groundwater temperatures. So one of the problems with biodegradation uh, in northern regions uh, is the colder the water, the slower these things um, degrade contaminants. So we kind of had that in the back of our minds and, and uh, we're, we're kind of 
tracking the groundwater temperature versus the, the amount of uh, bacteria we were seeing in the water samples. And we didn't really see much of a correlation. Um, you know, the groundwater temperatures out there, upper 30s Fahrenheit, you know, in the wintertime, peak in the, in the upper 40s Fahrenheit. Uh, in the fall, you know, you get a little lag in temperatures before decreasing. And because the groundwater table is so shallow at this site, you, you kind of see a, a seasonal effect on you know, temperatures in the groundwater. And so this is uh, contaminant concentrations over time in one of the wells in that source area that got the amendments. Um, PCE, which is the black diamond, um, you can see just after July 16th is, is when we did the excavation and the soil amendment. Um, I'd like to point out this is a, a long scale uh, graph. So before we did this pilot study, you have PCE concentrations in the, the thousands of uh, parts per billion. And then that decreased over time to less than one, even zero. Um, and TC kind of went along with that. And then, like I said, DC is a little harder, and then also vinyl chloride. So you can see where they didn't quite drop as fast. Uh, and then there was a little bit of rebound on the DC. But, uh, And this figure here just is a, a different way of presenting the data. I, I think uh, so. These circles, you know, the percentage. If you look up at the legend, the blue represents PC, uh, green TC, and then uh, yellow DC. Red is vinyl chloride, and then pink is what we're after the the F. So what we're looking at is from uh, the baseline sampling before we did anything. And in the uh, treatment area, you, it's mostly blue and green. So it's, it, you know, what we're seeing in the groundwater is mostly PC and TC. And then afterwards, uh, and, you know, a, few, a year later, um, you're seeing in that treatment area, um, less blues and greens and, and a lot more pink, um, which just, you know, shows that it uh, was effective. This one right here, uh, well, 202, still blue and green, but that's right on the upgrade edge of the treatment set. Um, and then this slide just kind of shows the, uh, the two side by side. But previous slides, but uh, um, so it, uh, it kind of showed that 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 was a viable way of, of treating the site. Um, we did not treat the whole source area. Um, you know, this was a pilot study, but um, the results will feed into a, um, a corrective measure study to, to look at um, you know, further uh, remediation at the site. Because like I said, the air sparks vapor extraction system basically had run its course. It, it really wasn't removing any more contaminants. Um, and so there'll be some future evaluation. Um, I'd like to say that this, uh, these projects are, are uh, funded by uh, Civil Engineering Unit Juno. Uh, with the Coast Guard, um, they're kind of responsible for um, uh, implementing and managing these uh, environmental investigations and remediation projects at the base. Um, so, but uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much my presentation. Um, there's a picture here. It's a, a several Sitka black-tailed deer that would come visit us in the field across the street. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I guess we can go on to see if we have any questions. All right. Thank you, Rick, for that presentation.
Um, just to remind uh, everyone, um, the question pane um, is just over on uh, the side of the screen there. If you have any questions, um, this is your chance to uh, type them in there. Um, uh, if you have anything to ask Rick about the project or um, the environmental remediation or anything else uh, that you might have had, um, go ahead and put it on in there. Um, we'll be pulling some questions from there to ask Rick. So um, there we go. All right, so Rick, the, the first question that I wanted to address is um, kind of going back to what you uh, were uh, talking about in terms of the groundwater monitoring. Um, it looked like, um, you know, this this um, was a little bit a while ago. It looks like um, it ended sometime around 2019, at least, that I saw. So I was wondering if there was um, any um, update that, updates that might have had that you might have had for the groundwater monitoring or anything else that you've learned from that since um, since then, or um, just kind of what the the future is for um, the groundwater monitoring uh, program in general um, since putting this together. Yeah. So, uh, like I said. Um, CEU, you know, um, is, is responsible for, uh, you know, the cleanup of these sites. Um, and they, they've got, they, they do quarterly monitoring just for site contaminants, the VOCs, um, which they've been doing. Um, and that's being done by another contractor. Um, and they are getting ready to come out with a, a, another contract to specifically uh, it do like the additional investigation at the site um, to to uh, in addition to see how well this uh, amendment is, may or may not still be working um, to gather a little more information like I said to do a uh, a corrective measure study um, to to kind of come up with a you know a, a like this was a pilot study, but then the corrective measure study will actually be a, a full blown um, you know, medial action. So we don't we don't have right now any new uh, geochemical or, or uh, probial data. Um, we kind of estimated that this amendment would be effective for three to five years, and right about our last. Uh, groundwater sampling, um, it looked like it was starting to, to fade. Um, so my guess is, is uh, when we go back out there and collect additional samples, uh, we'll kind of see that uh, um, the changes to the groundwater chemistry that, that were caused by the amendment will probably start reverting back to what they were before. All right. Thanks. Um, and yeah, just uh, Ramona, yeah, go ahead. Um, type in any questions that you guys have. Um, I'm sure there's some out there. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about uh, so Brick. I know you said this was a, a pilot study uh, of, of sorts. Um, so again, kind of looking towards the future, um, what do you see? Um, do, do you foresee kind of this? Um, this process or this um, the soil amendment um, uh, kind of what you guys have carried out here um, being taken up um, through other pro uh, projects what are sort of the benefits of uh, you know the the pilot uh, that you've conducted here yeah so like I said that the area we excavated and put the amendment in wasn't the, the total source area in, in that eastern um, source area so um, we, we've kind of demonstrated that it, it is effective. So uh, it, it's quite possible what we'll do is just more of the same, but just over a, a bigger area. Um, one thing that we'll be looking at is um, in, in the, the, the southern source area with the air sparge vapor extraction system, 
Uh, we really don't know what the soil contamination uh, remaining uh, is like there, and, and that'll be one of the things investigated. Uh, the groundwater in that area is pretty close to the cleanup levels, not quite, but not far off. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's not inexpensive to you know move all that stuff out, equipment out, and and to uh, dispose of all that contaminated soil. Um, and so, for the concentrations that are likely remaining in that southern area, um, that that the cost may not the, the remaining concentrations may not justify the cost of, of doing that same technique in that location. So, uh, you know, it's possible. Um, this same company makes a, a similar product that's in a like a nanoparticle form that can actually be injected, and so we may we may look at that um, as a, as a less expensive alternative. Although we've <laughs> having learned in 2006, you can't inject stuff under high pressure at this site without it going somewhere you don't want it. Um, you know, we'd have to, any kind of injection uh, would, would have to be carefully looked at. All right, thanks. Um, and um, one uh, last question here. Um, I wanted to uh, ask if you could just expand a little bit more about some of the logistics. I think you touched on them, particularly with shipping of the sludge containers, um, but Obviously, one of the challenges that you had was, um, you know, as this is a, a fairly remote site, um, uh, you know, getting the, the sh shipping containers there for the sludge and then for the uh, contaminated hazardous waste. Um, so, um, could you go uh, a little bit more about sort of kind of what you, um, how you kind of addressed those uh, challenges? Yeah, I like. Like I said, uh, getting the containers up isn't too bad, uh, you know, as far as um, you know, coordinating with the, the disposal landfill. Uh, that's who we, we got the containers from. Um, was I got to get from Oregon to Tacoma and then get on a barge to Kodiak and then get trucked over to the site. But because they're empty, that's easy. Um, like I said, the soil that we dug out of this site is a, a RICRA hazardous waste. And so once you generate a RICRA hazardous waste, a clock starts ticking. Um, and you, and, you know, you got to manifest things and all your transporters got to be all lined up. And uh, so the the like I said with the, the Canadian waters, you know, we have these containers all stacked up on the base, uh, waiting for Canadian authorization um, to transport this stuff through their their waters, um, and they just weren't forthcoming with that. I mean, we've 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 dealt with that issue a lot. And usually, you know, it's four, six weeks at most. Uh, in this case, it was like three months, four months, and we still weren't hearing back. Um, so that's when we kind of were like, uh, well, we, get, we need to figure out a different way to get this stuff off the island um, down to Tacoma. So like I said, the, uh, the barge service uh, that comes out of Kodiak, they, they make a variety of stops. Uh, and one of them is uh, at Seward, uh, Alaska, which is on the road system for South Central Alaska. So, um, yeah, we 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 transported those containers uh, to Seward, but then we had to revise manifests because now we had a different trucking company um, that that wasn't part of the original plan because um, the containers had to get trucked from. Seward up to uh, Anchorage because um, there's uh, two big services out of Anchorage, Matson and Toad, um, and so they're they have you know uh, their actual ships as it versus a tug with a barge, and so they 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 stay out in blue water, um, and so 
we don't need uh, didn't need that Canadian authorization because they don't go through Canadian waters. Um, so yeah, it's a bit you know you're scrambling around uh, redoing manifest to include these different shippers that weren't part of the original plan. Um, but then uh, once they arrived in Tacoma, um, that that goes fairly smoothly because they're they're used to that. It it actually gets offloaded from the, the barge or in this case the ship, um, gets trucked over to the railroad, goes on a train, and then that train actually takes those containers into the landfill um, where where all this soil was disposed of at a, a river hazardous waste landfill. Um, so yeah, it just uh, kind of get bemused sometimes about how we dig up this contaminated soil out of a place like Kodiak and then and it just makes this <laughs> several thousand mile journey mm -hmm. um, to get put back in the ground again. But where it goes in the ground is the line landfill with leachate collection and treatment and all that versus being uncontrolled um, where it came from. All right, yeah, it definitely sounds like a, a great, uh, you really had to pivot uh, uh, there and be a little innovative, but uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Rick. Um, um, and then um, one uh, last question that uh, just came through here, it said, um, what involvement was there, um, if any, um, with uh, the USP, uh, EPA, um, which um, I believe, um, there, you know, there's definitely uh, some stakeholder involvement if I remember the article correctly. Um, but um, I'll just I'll let uh, you uh, address that, Rick. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot, um, <laughs> and in both EPA and then the Alaska Department of Environmental Conversation (ADEC), um, they both are very interested in the site. Um, they're, they're very hands-on with their oversight. Um, you know, before we did any of this work, you know, we prepare work plans. And in this case, we actually did a separate work plan for each phase. It just seemed to be a little easier to break it up that way. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, you know, these draft work plans are submitted uh, for review and comment. And then, um, you know, we had a number of, of meetings uh, to resolve the comments and, and the kind of clarify our approach and um, and how we were going about this because um, yeah they 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 they, uh, they were very much interested in what we were doing how we were doing it what the results were so it was there was yeah many hours of phone calls and meetings uh, with both the EPA and DEC all right. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. All right. So thank you. Um, and uh, thank uh, uh, everyone uh, for attending uh, today's webinar. Um, if you are interested in submitting an article for the military engineer, um, please visit our website for our editorial calendar and the guidelines. Um, our uh, January, February issue, as you see, our main theme is indeed environmental engineering. Um, so if you have a similar project that you'd like to uh, share with us. Um, we'd love to take a look at it. Articles, article uh, submission deadline is the 27th of October. Um, after leaving uh, the webinar today, um, you'll all be directed to a brief survey um, just to um, get your thoughts about today's presentation. Uh, we do greatly appreciate if you can give us a little time and uh, give us any and all feedback that you have. Um, before you leave, make sure that you download your PDH certificate from the handout section if you haven't already. So on behalf of SAME, the military engineer, and our featured uh, presenter, thank you all for joining us today. Hope you all have a great rest of the day, whether it's morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Thank you again. Thanks, Daniel.